Hi, everybody, and it's welcome IPOC. to another episode of Taking Stock Live with me, your host, <laughs> Cody Lo Reynolds. I am having some technical issues today, so please bear with me if you see me chipping out or if something happens. I don't know what's going on with the internet today. I'm plugged in, I'm wired. It usually isn't a problem, but tonight, for some reason, is not cooperating so hopefully we are able to get this ball rolling very quickly because we have a great show coming up for you so let's see what we have lined up online learning it's ipo season online learning institution edufocal is the latest company ready to go public through an initial public offer ipo the company is seeking to raise just under $130 million, with shares going for a dollar each. CEO and co-founder of Edufocal, Gordon Swaby, will join me. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Productive Business Solutions, PBS, is looking to increase its growth in 2022, as the company recorded its best year ever last year. And what investment implications will the Russia-Ukraine crisis have on your portfolio? we'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Global oil prices soared last week following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia is the world's third largest oil producer and second biggest producer of natural gas. After Thursday's invasion began, the global benchmark Brent crude rose to a high of 105 US dollars per barrel, while US West Texas Intermediate rose to over 100 US dollars per barrel. It's the highest either benchmark has reached since 2014. Both prices later sank below 100 US dollars after the United States and Europe announced harsh sanctions against Russia. In addition to the rising oil prices, analysts are predicting an increase in wheat and soy products. Russia and Ukraine contribute roughly 29% of global wheat exports and about 19% of world corn supplies. Wheat futures on Thursday reached a nine-year high of 926 US dollars per 5,000 brushels, while corn climbed to a fresh eight-month peak. The United States and Europe imposed a host of economic sanctions against the country last week in response to the invasion. The sanctions included export blocks and technology, freezing the overseas assets of Russian banks, as well as sanctions against Russian business people. Supreme Ventures Limited now owns 80% of gaming company Supreme Root. According to a notice posted on the Jamaica Stock Exchange's website, SBL acquired another 29% stake in the company. Supreme Root operates video gaming terminals and video slots at licensed establishments such as bars and restaurants. According to SVL, Supreme Root has over 170 employees across all of its locations and earns over 7.7 .7 million US dollars in annual sales. The acquisition reportedly involved a cash consideration of $1.42 billion and was executed through SVL subsidiary Prime Sports Jamaica Limited. Lasco Financial Services is partnering with Visa to relaunch its e-payment card. The company had previously partnered with Alliance Payment Services Limited to launch its co-branded e-pay MasterCard, Lasco Pay. Lasco Pay had allowed remittance customers to conduct cashless transactions with merchants. However, the card's service was disrupted when Alliance and its principals were charged with several regulatory and administrative breaches by the Financial Investigations Division. Alliance's services were suspended by the Bank of Jamaica, which affected Lasco Pay cardholders. Managing Director of Lasco Financial Services, Jacinth Hall Tracy, said the company is partnering with Visa for its e-card rollout. She said the new Lasco Gold Visa prepaid card is being tested in the market by friends and family for quality control purposes. Education technology company Edufocal is seeking to raise almost $130 million through an initial public offer. According to the company's prospectus, roughly 80 million shares will be available to the public for purchase. The other 50 million are reserved. The reserved shares include more than 35 million for key strategic partners and the remainder for lenders' options. All shares are going for just $1 each. The offer opens March 3 and is scheduled to close on March 17, but it could close early. The lead broker is Mayberry Investments, while JMMB is a selling agent. If the offer is successful, Edgefocal intends to list on the junior market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart.
our key word for 2022 is consistency. Now, I've told you before that you can start investing with as little as a thousand Jamaican dollars, but the key to growing that into actual wealth is consistency. So here's what we're gonna do. Step one, open your investment account. Step two, set up a standing order or a salary deduction with your employer to fund that investment account every month so that at the end of each month, you have money to buy stocks. Step three, you're gonna watch my show, Taking Stock with Khalilo Reynolds, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. on YouTube for news and analysis on the stock market. And if you're completely clueless as to how to get started, well, you take my Investing for Beginners Masterclass at khalilorunnels.com slash masterclass. 2022 is gonna be your year. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. IPO alerts, IPO alerts. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back to Taking Stock Live. And as you see, our topic of interest for the evening is Edufoco. My name is Kalila Reynolds, and I want to shout you out wherever you are, what part of the country, what part of the world are you today? Let me know in the chat where you're joining us from. And I crave your indulgence because I am having some technological challenges today. Today has not been my day. If you saw my IG stories, you know why. Uh, it's not been the best day at all. And now here we are with some internet issues and I don't know what's going on, but we're going to try to make it work as best as possible. So let me know in the chat, where are you joining us from? What's going on? Where are you at? I see non sequitur is talking about Lasco early. He says people sleeping on Lasco. I see David Duncan is representing all the way from the Bronx. Tavia D says, hi, checking in from Kingston. Odane Swaby says, Mandeville checking in. You related to Gordon, Odane? Rochelle Henry says, congratulations to KRM on recent award win. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. You're going to see a little bit more about that later on in the program. But in the meantime, let me introduce and let me know in the chat as well if you are uh, hearing me okay, because on my end, I'm kind of breaking up. So let me know if it's working well on your end. I call, how is the feed? Am I breaking up? Please let me know. Uh, Latoya is joining us from Kingston. Travel with Drea is in St. Elizabeth. David Lee is in Hanover. Kellyanne Kaur is all the way in Indianapolis. Hi, Kellyanne in Indianapolis. And uh, King K says, Portmore Live. And Richie says he's hearing me fine. So good, good. All right. So even though things are working a little bit slowly on my end, you guys are hearing me fine. That's what's important. Well, let me introduce our guest for the evening. And his name is Gordon Swaby. He's the CEO and co-founder of Edufocal Limited. They're the latest company to uh, launch an initial public offer, an IPO. So let's welcome Gordon Swaby to the show. Hi, Gordon. You're muted. So yes, unmute, yes, yes. Yes. How are you? Congrats on your award. Thank you. I'm big up to mommy Olivine. I just found out today that she's your mom. <laughs> yes, she <laughs> and is. And Daddy Lloyd. Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> big up to the parents all the time. So, Gordon, it's been 12 years you have invested in this edge vocal game. 10 years since you actually started operations, but 12 years since you had the idea, started working on the company. What a journey it has been. So tell me about your journey to this point. So, you know, I started out knowing nothing about business. Um, I, I company was registered when I was 19 years old. Um, no, I, was, yeah, I just turned 20 and, you know, it, it, I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, started Edufocal when I was in my second year at UTech. Um, you know, raised a very small amount of money, around 13,000 US dollars. Um, asked my father if he thought it was a good idea for me to take some time off from school. He surprisingly said yes. Um, oh, wow. And, you know, I still remember the day. It was, you know, we, we, we got the money in the summer of 20. 13 right um and you know at that point in time that's the most money i i, I <laughs> ever saw in my bank account well not even my bank account but edu focus bank account and um it, 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 i guess for me at the time it was a source of validation right so i took the time off you know decided to go full-time into edu focal 
And you know, my leave of absence from UTEC turned into me not going back at all. Um, but but UTEC, you know, was instrumental for me because um, the Technology Innovation Center was where um, we started. You know, I started at you know in, in what they'd call the student incubator at the time. I had a single desk, um, you know, sharing that space with others. And you know, but I had big dreams. I had big dreams, and I I, I have never doubted, not even for a moment, whether um, Edifocal could grow and expand. So, you know, I mean, long story, obviously, you know, it, it, it's been, you know, I had, I had IPO ambitions of, of you know, it, my goal was five years to list the company um, five years after its launch. And it took me 10. And, you know, most people don't make it to this point of IPOing. And, you know, they, you know, when we think about where we are now and the possibilities, you know, I say all the time that we have de-risked Edufocal. Um, you know, I've personally spent a lot of money in growing the company and, and so many investors have, you know, have put faith in us. Uh, and I say all the time, no investor has ever not received a great return on AD Focal, um, you know, and, and we hope to continue on, on that trajectory. So certainly it's been an amazing Sorry. journey, Khalil, and I'm happy um, that we've gotten to this point. Well, congratulations. So it took you a lot longer than you expected, but 10 years yeah. ago, 12 years ago, not a lot of people your age, if anybody your age, had ambitions of launching a company to take it to IPO. So, so that, that was ambitious to start. Mm -hmm. And daddy said yes, but he's an entrepreneur as well. So it runs in the Absolutely. family. Absolutely. So, you know, my, I remember growing up in Christiana, um, my father started out doing, I mean, I guess you'd call him a serial entrepreneur, uh, car rental, you know, he started an auto parts, you know, he's done so many different things. And, but, I mean, but one business in particular that, that always stands out to me is um, this, this business that we had called Top Pastries. Um, I remember my grandmother baking pastries to put in the showcase you know, you know, you have that showcase for pastries, but it was never, it was never, the showcase was built for that. So the showcase was custom built, not because we wanted it custom built, <laughs> because we couldn't afford, you know, we couldn't afford um, the one that, you know, is actually built for that. So it wasn't ideal, but those things kind of stand out in my head. Um, I also remember us never having a sign. I think it started out because we originally probably couldn't afford it <laughs> to have a sign for the business. But Tops eventually became one of the largest restaurants in Christiana. Um, and that's what I saw growing up, right? I saw my father um, trying different things, not having much money, but being industrious, leveraging debt <laughs> uh, to grow his business. You know, when I started out in Edifocal, I had no idea what equity was. You know, I, I had no financial sophistication. Obviously, I was 19 years old. Um, but what were you studying at UTEC? computer science. Um, I was studying to be a, a software engineer, but um, I was horrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always had um, creative ambitions. I wanted to, you know, I, actually, I, I say to people all the time, if I wasn't an entrepreneur, I'd be a chef. I've always loved the culinary arts. I love cooking, um, you know, and I, and I once compared entrepreneurship to cooking or, or compared cooking to entrepreneurship because you know, you spend all of this time, you know, going through the process, getting the ingredients, and then people consume the final version of it, not understanding that, hey, a lot of work went into that meal that you're, you're, you're having and hopefully enjoying. So, you know, here I am, 31 years old. I'm a, I'm a husband and I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a father. And, you know, I'm obviously not the same person, you know, that I was at 19 years old, far more experienced now. Um, and you know we're, we're we're very very excited about what we have. Um, we're very excited about the plans that that you know we, we have coming up. Did you meet your co-founder Paul Allen at UTEC? Oh, absolutely not. I met so I met Paul at um, an event at the time it was called Kingston Beta, it was started by Ingrid Riley. Um, I mean, it was such a great event. You know, she had it I believe once a month, and I pitched Edufocal. At Kingston Beta, I'm pretty sure Ingrid probably still has that footage somewhere. So I pitched Eddie Focal at Kingston Beta at the Jamaica Pegasus, and as far as I remember, it's the largest audience that she's ever had. But you know, you know, maybe not. Maybe I imagine it being such a large audience at the time. And um, after I made the pitch, Paul walked up to me, didn't know who this guy was, um, you know, said to me that he wanted to work with me and Eddie Focal, and you know, the rest is history. So it's, I mean, truly a great story. Um, you know, and I'm, you know, probably should write about it because 
I mean, Paul is one of the most talented developers I've ever met. I mean, personally, one of the most talented persons I've ever met, generally one of the smartest persons I know. Uh, and I'm happy that he, he, he jumped on board as my co-founder and, you know, decided to take that leap with me. Well, that's great because, like you said, you sucked at the, the computer <laughs> software yeah. part of yeah. it. <laughs> so you right. needed somebody like him to actually oh, develop uh, what you had in your mind. Yeah. What I am good at, though, is sales and business development. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, I've been focusing more and I've got the opportunity to focus more on that over the last couple of months. You know, as the company has grown and we continue to grow and, and you know, definitely, you know, I am I am I'm receiving more and more of the opportunity to focus more on, on business development and sales. And as I've said, you know, I'm excited about what we have coming up. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that we'll continue to grow from strength to strength. All right. Well, let's take a look at what Edufocal actually does. We have a short video to play. Edufocal. For students in grades four to six, we provide students with the tools, resources, and confidence they need to excel in PEP and pass for their top choice school. Register at edufocal.com for the opportunity to better your child's tomorrow today. Right. So tell us what we just saw there, Gordon. So you actually saw a video advertising um, our online school, full-time online school. We started it in September 2020 as an experiment. And uh, here we are in, you know, in, in March 2022. Uh, and <clears throat> we have over 50 full-time students in that school. But that's just one part of what Edifocal does. Um, the company is actually split into two divisions. Um, Edifocal Learn, which has the school under it, called Edifocal Academy. Also on the learn is Edufocal Plus and Edufocal Alpha. Edufocal Alpha focuses on asynchronous content. So videos, um, reading content, you know, questions and answers, you know, multiple choice questions, true and false, et cetera, right? And we, we cover the grades four and grades four, five and six curriculum. And then Edufocal Plus is an extra lesson program. Um, it's an hour each day, five days a week. Um, you know, we have a sizable amount of students there too. And then the other side of the company, the other division is called Edifocal Business. Um, we've worked with a number of clients, both in the private sector and the public sector, um, and our clientele continues to grow, right? And, and again, we're really excited about some of the clients we'll be working with in the near future. So that really is the business in totality. Um, you know, and, and Edifocal Business would have been around now for about two, two and a half years, um, I believe going into, into three years. Okay, so I want to hear a little bit more about these lines. You, the company came to prominence. I think I, I know of Edufocal because of your GSAT courses and now, now called PEP courses. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. is that your most uh, popular uh, program? So Alpha is called Alpha for a reason. Alpha is called Alpha because it was literally our first offering. Uh, when we launched at the Jamaica Pegasus in you know, March 15, 2012, so we're actually celebrating our, our, our 10th birthday in 14 days, um, when we launched March 15, 2012, we actually started with CSEC. We started with CSEC math and CSEC um, English with 100 questions. I'm not sure what I was thinking at the time, um, you know, but we started with 100 questions each and people started signing up. There was a lot of buzz um, and then the numbers started to decline. And, you know, again, in my 20 year old mind, I was panicking, concerned, but I've always been industrious and, you know, I said to myself, you know what, let's try GSAT. Let's try creating GSAT content for the platform. And, you know, we attempted to do it. You know, it, 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 we couldn't afford content. So I, you know, I went to different organizations. I remember going to e-learning Jamaica and then, you know, they told us no. I went to the Jamaica Observer. They told us no. But long story short, we eventually partnered with the Jamaica Observer, a massive partnership. You know, they paid us. We got content. You know, big up to Novia McDonald White, Adam Stewart, Dan Villawalk at the time, who was the managing director. Certainly, they 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 gave, they gave us a great foundation to start, um, and you know, we started to expand from there into other things. So, um, we've largely focused on GSAT, no called PEP, um, but that truly is the foundation of Edifocal. You know, but I always say to people, Edifocal is not a PEP company. PEP is one of the offerings that we have, and certainly it's been at the core of the business. Um, but it is not the only thing. We're an edtech company. We're an education technology company. Yes, our flagship product or offering, you know, just in terms of what we're known for, is PEP. But I think if you try to pigeonhole Edifocal into being a PEP company, then you kind of miss the point of the scope and what is possible 
in terms of the growth or the potential growth of the company um, and the different areas that we can touch into. So yes, we currently focus on PEP as a formal exam, but you know the possibilities are endless in terms of the other things that you know that we can potentially focus on in the near future. What's what's the cost of that uh, signature course? Because it's a monthly subscription, right? Correct. It's two thousand five hundred Jamaican dollars a month um, for Edifocal Alpha, which is the asynchronous content. Um, uh, Edifocal Plus is ten thousand dollars a month, and our full time school is fifty one thousand dollars a term. And all of this obviously is per student. Um, so when you when you look at, for example, um, you have about twenty eight thousand kids that sit the PEP exam each year at the grade six level. Um, but if you factor in grades four, five, and six, you're talking about potentially around 150, 200,000 kids in terms of the total market size right there. Um, I mean, there's also the possibility for us to focus on the lower grades, grades three to one, and also potentially focusing on grades seven to um, grades 11. But we're not there yet. We currently just focus on grades four, five, and six. There's also obviously the possibility of expansion into CSEC, which is not only a Jamaican exam, but a regional exam um, you know, with obviously hundreds of thousands of students and again, potentially other exams, but we're not, you know, that's not something we're considering right now. Um, and largely what is articulated or what is articul articulated in the prospectus is really, you know, where our headspace is right now. Mm -hmm. Two five is very affordable. Um, some may say that you have room to, to charge more for, for what you offer, especially yeah. now with inflation where it is. That's one of the things we mentioned in the prospectus. We spoke about the fact that right. despite, despite rising costs, you know, um, we decided to hold firm on our pricing, um, you know, but obviously at some point in time, you know, we'll have to reconsider, you know, our pricing. Right. We have a video showing what Edrifocal Plus is. So let's see that. Sure. Jimmy's struggling, you know. And I just can't seem to find the time to help him. Is this your reality? Is your child slowing down in school? Not adapting to the new normal? Are you too tired after work to help them? Well, here at Edufocal, we just might have the solution for you. Edufocal Plus is an extra lesson service that is geared towards children preparing for PEP. We use expert teachers with strong communication and mentorship skills. Monday to Friday, 4 to 5 p.m. Edufocal is the perfect combination with your child's day school structure. We offer both live and recorded sessions available to your child 24-7. Student report cards are also available so you can track their progress. We want to give your child a head start for 2022. Sign up by visiting our website at edufocal.com and selecting the Edufocal Plus package. At Edufocal, our goal is to make learning fun for your child. All right, and now I want to hear more about the business line, which is your newer line launched uh, just about two years ago. What does Edifocal Business do? So Edifocal Business focuses on two core things or two core offerings. The proprietary platform that we have, i.e. or proprietary LMS um, that we've been building for 10 years. Um, and we also focus on creating uh, corporate learning content for organizations. So some organizations that we've worked with use both or they leverage both of our offering, um, offerings. Um, some organizations, you know, only do one thing. So some we have arrangements with on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, one that was announced recently is our um, a partnership with BCIC and the Transport Authority. Um, I mean, that is a five-year transport right agreement. Um, and again, that's also something that we're very, very excited about and, you know, the public will hear more about soon. All right, so, so they give you the content or you develop the content? We develop it from scratch. Oh. But if we're, it is important to note, if we're developing content for organizations, we don't retain the, um, the IP for that content, right? Um, but if we're developing content for, you know, say, or, or, or pet platform, certainly we retain the, the intellectual property rights of that. But we retain, we retain IP rights of the platform generally. So we don't sell the platform we sell access to the platform. Gotcha. All right. So we've reached that point now, Gordon, where we've got to talk about the finances. So let's look at your financials. I believe you're going to share something for us. Sure. Let me just bring that up. One moment. All right. Uh, yeah. So we can jump back to the five-year um, numbers. All right. 
So, well, you want PNL balance sheet? We're looking at PNL. Walk us through it. Tell us what you're showing us. All right. So this is our five-year financials starting in 2016 to 2020. Um, in 2016, we did 6.7 million in revenue, seven seven hundred eighty nine thousand dollars in you know in a loss um, after tax loss. Well, there's no tax if you if you have a loss. Um, 2017, 8.8 million in revenue, 1.4 million loss. December 20, 2018 rather, um, 9.2 million in revenue, 8.9 million in loss. December 2019, 26.8 million in revenue, 7.1 um, 7 million in, in loss. Then 2020, big year of us, we jumped from 26.8 million in revenue to 102 million, um, 102.6 million. What and did you call it? The year of us? No, no, I just said that. I said it was a big year for us. <laughs> oh, a big year for us. <laughs> Obviously, you know, jumping from yeah, 26, the you know, pandemic. I mean, those numbers tell quite the story, right? Oh, so we see that, tra that upward trajectory and we see what happened in 2020. Schools were closed for a while right. and a ton of people came flocking to you. How did you manage that? I mean, that's a great story, Kalila. So when schools closed in March, the Ministry of Education reached out to us and asked us to make our service free. Um, you know, they said, listen, the schools, the schools are out, you know, we're asking if you could help us out. And, you know, we said, all right, let's do it. We made the service free. And I think within, within a month, we had about 40,000 kids signed up to the platform using it every single day. Um, you know, we're having hundreds of classes. I mean, it was, it was, it, it actually cost us a lot of money, um, because we were not earning from it. This literally was a nation good. This was something that we were doing in the interest of Jamaica. Also, the ministry didn't pay you to make it free? When you said make it free, I thought no, you meant the government was going to pay no. you. To no, so they did. We, we, we had no business arrangement with the ministry for about two months. Um, and there was obviously no certainty of, of anything. But, you know, after, after I imagine proving ourselves and showing that we could do the work, the ministry, you know, and, and Edifo Kaled entered into a commercial agreement. So, um, for I'd say for about two months, we sacrificed um, revenue and, you know, would have likely, you know, probably earned zero dollars in that period of time. So, you know, I mean, we don't talk a lot about that, um, you know, in the sense that what was important to us was giving back to Jamaica and, and shifting. When you look at our 2019 numbers moving from, you know, where we were and then, you know, looking at, we were about to ramp up even more. So we had had a lot of sales agents. Um, a lot of people don't know that, you know, we had sales agents on the ground visiting schools, making sales. That was actually one of the ways that we made money um, by physically visiting schools because Jamaica historically has low credit card penetration. We actually had to make sales on the ground in schools. So even today, up to this, you know, up to now, um, we have relationships with over 100 schools in Jamaica. So I always find this, this comment puzzling about, oh, schools are opening up, you know, edifocal focal is not going to um, make as much money. I find it puzzling because that was our original business. <laughs> that was a business that was growing. You know, so even in the CEO... Yes, but it's a legitimate the... concern, Gordon, because oh, no, we absolutely. had that spike here uh, from the pandemic. And the, but before COVID, you were at 20-something million, and then you went to 100-and-something million. So absolutely. you can understand, and, you, and we don't have the full figures for 2021 yet, uh, audited anyway. You can understand why people would be scared that 2020 was an anomaly and you wouldn't be able to sustain that. So, so you know, Kalila, people spend a lot of time looking at, or I'm going back to the, to the five year, people spend a lot of time looking at the 2019 to 2020 jump, but they don't spend a lot of time looking at the 2018 to 2019 jump, even though we had a loss. That was more than doubling our revenue in one year, right? So, so obviously, relatively speaking, the numbers um, were still small, but it literally was a doubling of revenue, right? So, I mean, Generally speaking, Eddie Focal, we've always had growth. And one of the things I speak about in the prospectus is the fact that um, COVID did not cause our growth. It accelerated it because we were always growing, right? In the earlier years of the company, we were, we were more focused on building the foundation of the company. Um, but with where we are now, we're also building, but also focusing on the bottom line. Um, a lot of things that, another thing that people don't take into consideration, in my opinion, too, is that if you look at our balance sheet, um, PPE, um, plant property is very small. We don't have a lot of physical footprint. You remember, Edu Focal does not run a physical operation. Everything we do is online, and that has been the case from day one. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is this. If we don't have 
physical assets, how do we get financing? Because mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to have collateral, right? Right. Because understand this, you know, what we're doing is literally creating an industry. There is no ed tech industry in Jamaica. It is being created as we speak. And EduFocal is at the forefront of that. The largest assets that we have on our balance sheet is our intangible assets. For most companies, and you can take a look at the Jamaican Stock Exchange and look at the financials of companies, when you see intangible assets on their balance sheet, it's because of goodwill. So they did an acquisition. It's booked on the assets as intangibles. For us, we create intangibles, right? In other what, words, what, what is intangible assets for you? That's like an intellectual... Or platform, or platform and the content, right? No, no. Yeah, so it's our platform and the content. No, I can't go to a commercial bank in Jamaica and say, hey, you, I want you to use our, 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 our um, intangibles as collateral, they're going to laugh at me. Uh, and understandably so. They, that's just not an environment because if we were to default on a loan, right, they can't sell our intangibles. Who are they going to sell it to? There's no industry for it, right? So, you know, so that's one consideration. And again, it's contextualizing everything. And again, all of this is in the prospectus, right? Now, if you look at our financing costs and you look at our September 2021 numbers, you'll notice that, I believe, let me just see if I can find that. If you look at our financing costs up to September 2021, give me a moment, let me just find it. Um, one second, send the management discussion analysis. All right, so if you look at our numbers up to September 2021, right, you'll notice that, uh, give me one moment. All right, here we go. So well, that was a, mm, one, one moment, Kalila. That's fine. That's no fine. problem. So if you look at our September 2021 numbers, right? And you look at, there we go. Let me just zoom in. So you look at our September 21 numbers. Finance cost up to September was $13.3 million. That is, <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. Now, I say that to say, putting it into context, because we don't have, because we're not a typical business and we don't have assets, land, you know, equipment to use as collateral. It means that the loans that we get are always going to be extremely high in terms of the interest rates, right? Now, can you imagine an edufocal? And again, if you look at our two-year projections, 2022, 2023, can you imagine a listed edufocal where financing costs come down significantly? Because that's obviously one of the benefits of a listed company. Financing becomes cheaper. But not only that, you're also talking about an edufocal where we have next to no debt, um, a significant amount of cash on hand, and a lot of opportunity for growth. So, you know, if we were listing Kalila in 2019, right, when we did 26 million in revenue and we projected $102 million in revenue in the next year in 2020, people would say, no, that's crazy because if you look at the previous <laughs> years, Absolutely you know, would. <laughs> so, so, you know, and you know the question is, you know, it's, it's always been so strange to me because every single year, and I mean, this is why we've been a private company, obviously. Every single year, some of the questions that we've gotten from bankers was, is your growth sustainable? Can you beat these numbers next year? And then every year we beat the numbers and we still get to ask the same question, right? So we've moved from 26 million in, in revenue to 102 million with a positive bottom line and also projecting a positive bottom line for 2021 and then you're looking at our 2022 and 23, 23 projections and you're asking the same question. So I suspect, so, Kalia, we get to 2024 um, and the numbers are even larger, both top and bottom line. People will be asking, oh, you know, so, you know, can you get more growth? You know, is it, is it, is it sustainable? So, look. So 2021, I, you're looking at 168 million, right? For the total year. So, yeah, that is what is shown in, in, the, in, the, in the prospectus. Yes, in terms of, it's, it's preliminary numbers. It's not unaudited, it's prelim numbers. Right, right, preliminary. But still, so if, if that materializes, that would be a 60-something percent increase over 2020. And 2020 was already a phenomenal year. So right. what, does, what happened there? So is it that you were able to <clears throat> retain a large amount of the, the clients who signed up in 2020? Or was it that the edufocal business side really took off in 2021? Both divisions, both divisions are growing, Kalina. And again, I want to repeat for your audience. If you think about EduFocal as a PEP company, you're missing the bigger point, right? Um, we have a platform, a powerful platform that can facilitate any exam type. The question I think it's important to ask is why have we not looked at other opportunities, 
right? And, you know, you spoke about my father earlier, and, you know, there's one thing my father has always said to me, Gordon, don't stretch yourself too thin. Focus on what you're good at, double down on it, get really good at it, and then you can look at expansion. Now, again, you look at our 2021 numbers, our 2020 numbers, yeah, 2021 numbers up to September, you've seen the growth, right? Now, the question is, again, Edufocal, possibly a listed company, next to no debt, a lot of resources, attracting new talent. What do you imagine that kind of company to be, right? So, so uh, I mean, I can't speak to what the future will hold, but, I mean, I, I'm very, very optimistic about our growth because we've had growth. And, and, and if you're only... Because you can't analyze Edufocal like a typical company. You can't analyze us like a typical manufacturing company because we're not the same. We don't operate in the same way. And a lot of what we're doing is breaking new ground, right? And and I think our numbers speak for itself. So let's see. Let's I mean, let's see what full year 2021 looks like. Let's see what Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and 2022 numbers look like. Um, and we can have that conversation again. You know, I'll come back on the program and we can talk a little bit more about our numbers at that point in time. All right. Let me start taking some questions from the audience. So Steph wants to know, what percentage of the company's educational learn versus education edifocal business and how has this percentage grown from 2019 to 2022? So learn accounts for about 40% of our business. Um, sorry, edifocal business accounts for about 40% and um, learn accounts for, for the difference. Oh, oh, because <laughs> I was like, whoa, business already outperforming learn in such a short amount of time. All right. And that would account for, so I saw in Prospectus where you had, um, I guess, like spend per client. What was it called? I forget the, what the term was. It's, uh, so it's average revenue per user. Per user, yes. That's what it was. So, so that would account for that because the business clients obviously pay a lot more. Correct, correct. All right. TKC wants to know, what's the plan to expand? How do you plan to market the platform? So the prospect also speaks to that. Obviously, I can't speak to anything that is not in the prospectus. Uh, if you look at, um, let me just find that. If you look at our two-year financial forecast, um, let me just go back to the top so I can just use it. You know, uh, so I had said on Twitter, Khalil, that you know, I, 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 one of the things I'm proud about is that our table of contents is clickable, right? So you can actually click. The, um, that is pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> Brings you to the section here, yeah? right? Um, but in 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 the two year in a two year forecast, we said that. Let me just find it. Give me a moment. Um, so here's where we go. You look at uh, fifteen point two point one. Um, to the latter part of it, we say Eddie Focal is also positioned to execute on strategic plans for expansion in the local market as Jamaicans have become increasingly more tech savvy and show signs um, of moving towards a larger scale online learning society. More specifically, we see opportunities to leverage sales through key physical distribution points across the island for our current offerings, di diversify the use of our proprietary learning management system in tertiary environments, developing non-traditional educational content for, for, um, for sale, for example, financial literacy, or interactive content for financial compliance and other initiatives that will significantly add to our bottom line without material impact on our operating expenses. So that's one big thing that I've actually not heard anybody <laughs> talk about. Um, and again, I repeat for the audience, if you think about us as just a pep company, um, you're, you're limiting your imagination in terms of what is possible for our growth. Well, financial literacy, you're speaking my language. Maybe we should do a KRM Edufocal collab. There you go. So, I mean, we have the team, we have the resources. Um, we are, the, you know, we are experts in the ed tech space. Um, we know how to deploy content. Um, we know how to deploy it at that affordable cost, and we've gotten significantly better at it. So, again, um, look out for great things from us. Look out for even greater things from us. And and, and thank you in advance to, to the investors that are jumping on board and, and supporting, um, you know, supporting a, a great company, in my opinion. You know, I think Edifoca is an amazing company, and we're poised for even greater growth. I see a few people asking this question and it ties into what we were discussing a little bit earlier as well. Again, asking about, you know, post pandemic. So uh, this person says, Edupoca intrinsically linked to COVID-19. Well, I, I think they mean the growth. 
in 2020. Where will the booming revenue come from once face-to-face -face resumes? And also, are we already seeing the effect of this change with the 2021 results so far? I mean, our 2021 results look better than our 2020 numbers, so I'm not... But you did not... post a loss in 2021. Sorry, say that again? But you did post a loss in 2021, no? Up to September, not, but full year does not show a loss. Full year shows um, profit that is greater than 2020. That's what the premium How numbers show. The profit? I swear I saw a, a negative... No, and again, that's another thing people don't talk about. <laughs> our premium numbers show up, show profit. Yeah. For the full year, yes, you are right. So for the full year right. is 13 million in profit. And then for the nine months to September, there is a one, almost $1.5 million loss. All right, all right. And I ask okay. again, if all we right. didn't have the financing costs, then you can understand what our bottom line would also look like up to September, 2021. Let me see if I can, no, it's gonna take too long for me to share my screen and get to that page. Cause I'm oh, reading yeah, off my tablet because my, compu my computer is moving slow. I wanted to show them the numbers for end of 2021. If you have it, you can, you can do it there, Gordon. Let me just bring it up. I should be able to find it. Um, forgive me. Let me just click here. It's in the MDNA. Um, we are projecting um, preliminary numbers. Um, let me zoom in. So we're pre preliminary numbers, 168 million in revenue, $13.5 million net profit after tax, 14.9 million. Right. That's that's um, what I was talking nobody about. Nobody talks about that either. They talk about the, the <laughs> they talk about the nine month loss. So again, you know, everything is perspective. It's all there in the prospectus. You just have to read it. Um, yeah. All right, Philip wants to know what happens during the summer months. We develop courses for our clients on the business side. <laughs> mm. No summer school. I mean, we can. So there are a number of things that we do that are are short term. You know, so we have like me a mental ability marathon where we just focus specifically on helping kids for their mental ability exam. Um, but there are a number of initiatives that we, we 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 are excited about, and the public will hear more about soon. All right, so let me see. Um, this other person says four consistent years of pre-tax loss. I'm not comfortable with that. What? How do you speak to that, Gordon? Well, then Eddie Fuqua is not looking for that kind of investor. Because mm, mm. yeah. you do have to understand that this is a fairly young company. And we have different types of investors. That's, that's a great point, Gordon. You have different types of investors. So you should know yeah, your really. investment profile. If you yeah, man. Are so different kind of investors. Make up the market. If you're more of a risk taker. Yes, go ahead. No, no, I'm saying that different companies make up the marketplace, right? And, and I think, you know, every, every investor, you know, should figure out what their risk profile is and speak to your licensed financial advisor and make an informed decision. I think that we've shared a lot of useful information in the prospectus. Um, and investors are armed with knowledge um, and, you know, they have to make the right decision for themselves and their family. Rick says, is Edgefocal business an alternative for, I don't even know how you say that, Arian and Moodle platforms? Mm -hmm. So Moodle actually is the most common LMS and, and Moodle is open source. It's, 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 it's free, but not really because you have to hire people to... To, 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 you know, develop the platform, add new features and so on and so forth. It can be very technical. So, I mean, we, we are in a way a competitor to Moodle. We're a local competitor to Moodle. Um, but, I mean, one of the things that we do also is actually um, offer support for, for, for clients. So, so when I mentioned earlier that there are clients who have their own LMSs and we just, you know, add content to it and, you know, help them with the administration of it. That's something that we also do on the business side. Mm. Imran says, what about Edgefocal having physical locations? Is that something you consider or you prefer to stay as a completely virtual company? No, Edgefocal will never consider um, physical. If we do consider physical, we're either partnering with an existing entity that has a large footprint, um, or we, you know, we, it's some kind of temporary um, arrangement. Mm. Tatiana is giving you congratulations. She says scaling a tech startup in Jamaica is not easy. Congrats, Gordon. Uh, Richard you. says, 
Online school is the way. There will be an expansion in the educational offerings, yes, but there needs to be a great expansion outside of just primary and secondary schooling. So, and, and you said you, do, you have identified some growth areas there, including the financial literacy and also the, on the business side of, of Edufocal, yes? And we're looking into it. You know, we're looking into it. Here is a great question from Roger Hall. How do you protect your intangible assets from cyber attacks? It's a great question. So, you know, that's, that's a question that my CTO is better uh, positioned to answer. But I do know, I mean, actually up to today, we had a meeting um, about securing our, 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 our intellectual property. Um, you know, we had a meeting with a company that specializes in that. Um, but there are a number of other things that we can do and we'll likely do in the near future to ensure um, our, our intellectual property is secured, including possibly having insurance for our IP and the platform generally. Okay, I saw another good question. Let me try to find it again. Uh, oh, yes, it was about the share price. Javan wants to know, how did the $1 price come about? So we have we have a great, um, we have a great, um, you know, investment banker in Mayberry, um, you know, super talented folks there. Um, they ran the numbers and that's how they came up with the $1 per price. Um, so, you know, big kudos to Rachel Curlew, Dan Theok, um, Chris and Gary and others at, at Mayberry. Really, really amazing place um, to do business with. And we're happy to have, have them as our, our partners. Mm. Steph asked a question that tells me that she read the prospectus. So Steph says, rebalance sheet. Can you speak to the receivables numbers? How does it call actions? So, I mean, interestingly enough, Kalila, the pandemic made collections harder, um, especially the work from home orders and considering that we do business mm -hmm. with both government. It's, it's such a weird thing, right? We do business with both government and the private sector. Um, but people don't actually, prepay for your course because it's a monthly subscription. It, it depends on the contract. Like huh? It depends on the contractual. It depends on the, the, the arrangement. Because remember, we have different entities, companies that we work with. For some relationships, it is recurring revenue. But even if it's recurring revenue, um, we may not get all of the money up front. So some of it, you know, maybe a prepayment or you know, something to that effect. But there are still balances that we actually have to follow up and you know get collected. So that's something that we actually plan on on, on addressing um, this year, and something that we definitely will um, move to improve um, for, for for financial year twenty twenty two and beyond. Mm. Tiffany said wants to know why did the efforts to grow in Nigeria and Trinidad fail? Great what question. happened in Nigeria and Trinidad? So, you know, that's a great question. And, and I love that question, Tiffany, because we didn't talk about Nigeria or Trinidad in the prospectus, which means that you... Right, that was, uh, she kind of... All right, good. Which, that which one the left field. I, I wasn't right. aware of that. So, you know, goes back to my point earlier, right, about um, focus. You know, so while there were many opportunities out there for us, I think that attempting to expand to Nigeria and Trinidad was a little bit premature. We didn't have the team, we didn't have the experience, and we didn't have the resources. Um, so I made the call as um, CEO at the time to focus on Jamaica because that's where we were, that's where we lived, and that's where we had the most experience and connections in doing business. So that was that was a strategic decision. Um, and since that time, we've largely focused on business in Jamaica. So I'm going to take just a few more questions because I'm looking at the time now, and we have quite a few good ones. Sherwin wants to know if they can gain international qualification through this medium. Not yet, but anything is possible. I mean, again, Edifocal, PEP is one of the many, many, PEP is what we offer as our core, and then you know of Edifocal business. But certainly in the future, um, it's, it's something that management will consider and look at as, as opportunities, but no immediate plans for that. Uh, Carib Zone says, can we access Learn from the US? Absolutely. You can access Learn from anywhere on earth as long as you have an internet connection. Mm -hmm. Great for diaspora parents who are trying to give their kids a Caribbean education. Absolutely. Absolutely. David Duncan wants to know if there is any competition locally or regionally. So we do have competition locally, but we don't spend time talking about our competitors. We focus, <laughs> we focus more on our business and servicing the needs of our customers. I mean, we love our customers. Um, anybody that decides to spend a dollar with Eddie Focal, we are extremely grateful um, and that is where we're invested. You know, we're invested in delighting our customers and growing the company. Learn, Grow, Invest Club asks, what is the projected average revenue per user for 2022? 
So that's not something that we want to comment on now, especially because it's not in the prospectus. I don't want to get in trouble with the FSC. Um, but look out for that. You know, look out for more information on that in, in the near, in the very near future. You know, so so Kalila, sometimes you know people think that you know CEOs don't want to necessarily share information, but that's not what it is. You know, it's just that you know we are about to be a listed company, and we have to be mindful about what we share. You know. Understood. Philip has another question. How much of a hindrance is Jamaica's low internet access penetration? I was having issues this evening. And device yeah. access. And are there any potential collaborations that educational Educofocal can explore to improve these? Absolutely. I feel that's such a great question. Um, you know, I think one of the positives of the pandemic is that I feel like the government um, is going to be investing a lot in um, developing our, our internet infrastructure and, and having more Jamaicans have access to the internet. But not only that, once you have access to the internet, training is also important, right? So we have to train our people. And you'd be surprised the things that people struggle with, which is also an opportunity, by the way, right, in terms of educating our people. So um, again, we do have plans to address that. Um, it's something that management is looking at right now. Um, stay tuned. Um, and we're making possibly making some announcements on that soon. But you know, let's see how it goes. And let me take this last one. Sherwin says, we're already leading in GSAT, C well, PEP, GSAT, PEP, CSEC and CAPE level, but not leading in university level. What's your plan for that here in Jamaica? Educational university? So we're ignoring the noise, focusing on executing. Um, you know, it, it's important that we stay focused. Um, but... Again, you know, you, you never know. And, and I mean, we talk about that a little bit in the prospectus in terms of where we see growth here. So let's see. Let's see how 2022 looks and, and what, what we'll be looking at. All right. So let me wrap it up by asking you, how can people apply for this IPO? How can people participate? So um, you can participate by signing up for a Mayberry account, which is, I mean, Mayberry historically has a $1 million limit, uh, $1 million uh, requirement to open an account. Minimum. Minimum, but that actually has been waived for um, the IPO. Um, so you can actually go to Mayberry Investments website and you can start signing up and the entire process is done online. Um, you're going to need some documents, you know, uh, bank statement, pay slips, et cetera, et cetera. But again, all of that can be facilitated online. The offer opens on um, Thursday. You know, actually it would have opened on Wednesday if it wasn't a holiday. Um, so it would have opened tomorrow, but because it's a holiday, tomorrow's Ash Wednesday for those who don't know it's a holiday. Um, you know, it, the offer is opening first, first opening first thing on, on Thursday at 9 a.m. So I said I'm wrapping up and then I just re realized there are a few questions, quite a few questions I didn't ask you from my own <laughs> list. Dividend policy. Sorry, pardon, say that again. I missed that. Dividend policy. What's your dividend policy? Um, I actually need to bring it up. We do have a dividend policy. Um, I think it was something like 25% if, if yeah, you have it basically. Turn. So let me just actually find it. Dividend policy. Okay, so it says um, the company is still in its growth stage and uh, as it continues to expand and develop its platform and services. However, the company's revenue streams are recurring in nature and the board expects that the company will perennially, perennially have excess profits over and above its reinvestment needs. Based on that expectation, the company has adopted a dividend policy targeting a payout, not exceeding 25% of net profits after tax. The company's dividend policy is subject to the company's reinvestment needs, including investment in its platform and the availability of sufficient distributable reserves for each financial year. The company reserves the right to revise its dividend policy as the need arises. Yeah, I like that you just deferred directly to the prospectors. Yeah, like, let me not get misquoted here. Nobody, <laughs> nobody quote me wrong. Let me just right. say, let me just take it from the source. Uh, there was another one I wanted to get to. Oh, last week I had your friend Lauren Peart on the show, we and we were talking about yeah, we we're talking about the possibility of uh, of his company Blue Dot doing an IPO as well. And you know he had well, you know, you know the situation with with Lauren and where he is at now. And one of the things he said is that when you are operating under a listed company, as in when Blue Dot was under SSL, is that you live your life in quarters, or the company lives in quarters. 
And now that he is looking to transition in the next couple of years to a listed company, uh, mm -hmm. that will become even more intense. You prepared for that kind of scrutiny, Gordon? You ready for all? You ready for that? In, you know, you know, Kalila. I've actually always. You want to bamba? Life. You want to cheer <laughs> with the good boys? <laughs> I've always in my life actually out in the open. I mean, I've actually openly spoken about Eddie Focus growth, some of the things that we've struggled with. I mean, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, you know, it's just that no, I I won't have a choice. But we have a trust me, um, Kalila. We have a strong team. Um, you know, my speciality is, is business development and sales. We have a solid C, um, CFO in Kenyon Haynes Burke, a solid um, CTO in Paul Allen, and the rest of the management team are all truly amazing people. Um, and we're just excited about this next chapter for us. Yeah, back off abroad, though. Yeah. Back yeah. got to be broad. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Young yeah. CEO, 31 years old. Tech, I, think tech tech actually, I think I think Eddie Focal is going to be, I think I'm going to be the youngest um, person to ever list a company on the stock well, exchange. Congratulations sure, to you on that. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's but, but what is where I live in, I live in dreams now. Is delivering solid results, solid returns for investors. And that's what I'm focused on. I'm I'm not focused on optics. I'm focused on delivering solid results every quarter. Um, I'm just going for growth. I'm excited, I'm energized, and I'm ready to go. And the last important thing I forgot to ask you about, what you're going to use the money for? So the prospector speaks to that to, um, you know, clearing short-term or clearing some short-term debt um, and using the rest for, for, for um, capitalizing the business. Yeah. Debt and, and what you said? So debt and also using it for, um, for, for capitalization of the business. So using it to, to grow. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, investing in projects and so on and so forth. Yeah. Well, all the best when it opens, uh, Gordon. Thank you. It's a, it's a small offer. So, very small viewers, offer. Listeners, if you're interested, uh, make sure you do that early. Gordon mentioned that you can apply through Mayberry and you can also apply through JMMB's Money Line. Right now, that's the only selling agent. So, just those two. Um, and tomorrow's a holiday, Ash Wednesday. So, you got to get moving, get cracking online and see what you can do between now and then. Well, like I said, congratulations on this big move, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you, Kalila. The Thank you for of a listed company. Mommy must be so proud. And wifey, Kamisha. Hey, Kamisha. Hi, yes, you're in the background, right? I was in the background, Kalila. That's me and her in the background, you know. Ah, nice. Wait, here we go. Wait, no. I yeah. see it. There you Our go. Side. Yeah, nice. We got my wife. Love her very much. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to be on the lookout for this. Thank you for joining me, Gordon. Thanks for having me, Kalila. Have a good holiday. Get some rest. <laughs> Look who's <laughs> telling me. <laughs> yeah. You must be laughing watching this, but get some rest. Uh, yeah. Nice. I don't be Anyway, let me not say what I was going to say. Anyway, mm -hmm. thanks again, Jordan. <laughs> Gordon. That's, that's because you need some rest there, you know? It's very tired. <laughs> Gordon. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's like nine o'clock at night and I've had a long day. We'll talk mm -hmm. again soon. Yeah, man. Definitely. And Thank you, everybody. For, our viewers, mm -hmm, yeah, for our viewers, make sure you like the video. You know, that makes a huge difference in the algorithm in letting YouTube tell other people how many people like this video and recommending it to more people. So drop us a like, please. Also subscribe to the newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. And if you've been watching this just out of curiosity because you hear IPO, but you really don't know what IPOs are all about, what investing is all about, then you should take my Investing for Beginners Masterclass at kalilareynolds.com slash masterclass. Up next, it's your market recap. Let's find out who were or which stocks were the best and worst performing of the week. And that will be followed by the analysts. Let's find out what they think of Edgefoco. of taking stock was brought to you by bulwark insurance agency insurance made easy time now for your market recap the jamaica stock exchange declined with the combined index losing nearly 3,000 points or nearly one percent 115 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week ending friday february 25 2022 57 advanced, 53 declined, and 5 stayed the same. 230 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $1.28 billion. JMMB Group 7.35% cumulative redeemable preference shares was the most traded stock. People bought and sold nearly 103 million shares in the company. 
The stock lost one cent to open on Monday at three dollars fourteen cents. Wigton Wind Farm ordinary shares traded the second highest volume. People bought and sold twenty four million shares in the company. The stock price remained unchanged to open the new week at 54 cents. And QWI investments rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 7% of market volume with 15 million shares trading. The stock price remained unchanged to open this week at $1.03. Now let's see who had the biggest gains for the week. I create ordinary shares jumped nearly 18% to close last week at 80 cents. Fesco continued its climb up 17% to open this week at $5.02. And rounding out our biggest gains, Epley 6% preference shares due 2024 is up 15% to open this week at $1.13. On the losing side now, SSL Venture Capital Jamaica was this week's biggest loser down nearly 27% to open the new week at $1.33. KLE Group was this week's second biggest loser. The stock fell 19% to open the new week at $2.18. And MPC Caribbean Clean Energy was down 17% to close last week at $98. $20. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers. All right, welcome back. And before I introduce our next segment, let me tell you to take our poll question. And the question simply is, will you be investing in the Educal IO? Let us know in the comments. You can also know by taking our poll. And that is on my YouTube channel. At the, on the community tab of my YouTube channel. So if you're using a laptop or a cell phone, you can go to youtube.com slash Kalila Ray and click on the community tab. And that's where you get the poll. Sometimes it comes up on your feed as well if you're using a mobile device. Now, before I introduce my analyst panel, we've got to do a little bit of bragging. So I have a little something, something to show you. And here are the nominees for excellence in reporting on agriculture. Kalila Reynolds, Janelle Rodriguez, Orain Thomas, Kalila Reynolds Media, Christopher Sergio, The Gleaner, Vanessa Silvera, The Jamaica Information Service, and Andre Williams, The Gleaner. The journalists who topped the competitive field vying for excellence in reporting on agriculture are Kalila Reynolds, Janelle Rodriguez, and Arane Thomas of Kalila Reynolds Media for the Belizean Sugar Story. In her winning story, Kalila took a trip to her home country to explore how they've been able to sustain their sugar industry even amid challenging times. The judges said it was an excellent production, well researched, prepared, executed, and presented, resulting in an attention grabbing product. Congratulations, Kalila, and thanks to our sponsored sponsors, JMCC. Hey. 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 We still are win. We still are win. We still are win. Yes. And for some people who are saying, how come we win but agriculture? Did you not know that agriculture is big business? And covering that particular story really, you know, brought that full circle for me, really opened my eyes as to how much indeed agriculture is a business. You register your farm as a business. You have a farm, you absolutely should register it as a business because farming is a business. A farm is a business. You go into it uh, with the intention of selling your products at a higher price than you put into growing the products. So yes, it is a business. And yes, so that's why we won for excellent reporting on agriculture. We we're nominated for three. We won one. I'm super happy for our very young company to win its first award under the banner of KRM. So Hey, yes, and thank you for all the congratulations that I'm seeing there in the comments. Time now to introduce our analyst panel. Let's see who we have this week. We've got with us investment, research, and sovereign risk analyst at JMMB, Leovani Dillon, business writer at the yeah. Observer newspaper. 
David Rose, and I hear that that title is going to be changing pretty soon. And we also have financial coach, founder, and CEO of Profit Jumpstarter, Keisha Bailey. Watch David eye open big like a bus of news. <laughs> uh. Oh, not ready to you're not ready to bust the surprise yet, David. But I heard people talk. You know, is David uh. muted? I'm not hearing you. I'm not muted. It's just the lagging connection, you know. I'm not hearing. Or, or am I frozen? It is, it is, it is a lagging connection. One. It is a lagging connection, Kalila. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Can you, you guys talk to me because I'm not hearing anything? Hear yeah, I can hear you, David. Yeah, man. I can hear you, David. And Kalila, too. Yeah. I'm sure. You the can't lag. hear us, Kalila? I am not and here are the nominees the for excellence in reporting on agriculture. Kalila Reynolds, Janelle Rodriguez, Orain Thomas, Kalila Reynolds Media, Christopher Sergio, The Gleaner, Vanessa Silvera, The Jamaica Information Service, and Andre Williams, The Gleaner. The journalists who topped the competitive field vying for excellence in reporting on agriculture are... Kalila Reynolds, Janelle Rodriguez, and Orain Thomas of Kalila Reynolds Media for the Belizean Sugar Story. In her winning story, Kalila took a trip to her home country to explore how they've been able to sustain their sugar industry, even amid challenging times. The judges said it was an excellent production, well-researched, prepared, executed, and presented, resulting in an attention-grabbing product. Congratulations, Kalila, and thanks to our sponsored sponsors, JMCC. You're on mute. Mute. Yeah. All right, so I am hearing you all now, and mm -hmm. let's give this another go. So, David, I hear I hear big things coming, man. Are you not ready to bust the secret yet? The surprise? <laughs> bust what? Bust what? Bust what? <laughs> bust what? <laughs> no, no comment, no. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start with Edgefocal since we just finished that conversation there with Gordon. I'd like to hear your early thoughts on Edgefocal IPO. All three of you. Let me start with I'll start with David. <laughs> Yeah, you, can't, you have good right, you know, but uh, to be honest, it's a uh, good look. Uh, Gordon, you know, is benefiting mm -hmm. from the junior market that have been established uh, so, uh, 12 years ago. So, you know, and this is the opportunity for the company to further grow mm -hmm. and capitalize on its momentum. Because you have to understand that, for one, as Gordon mentioned it, the technology company. So really, actually, they have a lot of flexibility in what they can actually do and achieve. So the thing is, unlike a traditional business, which should be restricted to a geographical space based on its uh, total assets that, you know, or physical space that needs to actually get clients, it just needs a internet connection and a person to have a credit card, debit card, or other means to tap up to their account or access the platform. And the thing is, uh, the business side itself is also pretty attractive because once a company can establish the, you know, recurring stream of revenues, from those attractive spaces with regards to, you know, corporate companies looking to train their employees, you know, making them make very difficult, make any focal, the attractive option versus, you know, an international platform, I keep the quote unquote income in Jamaica, then there's so much that they can do. So their growth is a lot, it's not just limited to, you know, just Jamaica. And it's going to be interesting to see what they can do. Looking forward to, you know, seeing how the IPO goes based on its opening time and, you know, when it's supposed to close in the next two weeks and they see what Gwendolyn can do for shareholders this year. Leo, your thoughts on Edgefocal? I mean, overall, it, it, it has a lot of positive. Um, I think some of your viewers, you know, the questions that they asked her, so you know, some of the questions I think were, were some good questions. Um, that being said, though, I like the overall structure of the company and what it's trying to accomplish at the very at the very heart of it, what they're trying to accomplish in terms of, you know, growing education in Jamaica and, you know, eventually, I guess, you know, across the Caribbean and across, you know, the wider region, that is a, um, a good focus. It seems a very, um, the revenue is there. 
the potential profitability is there. I mean, if you just strip away the, you know, the debt in the company's numbers, you see some strength. Um, I think how you can look on this company as a, you know, for the average investor, you can look on it um, as it's not, it's, it's definitely not going to be like, you know, a consumer staple. Um, it's not going to be that to the pro being, the upside to it being that it has that potential for some strong growth. Um, it's, as you said, you know, it's a relatively new market. Um, and the downside is that there's potential that, you know, you could see some losses. So whereas, you know, with a consumer staple, you know, you know, revenue profit is going to more likely be there, um, you know, year in, year out, despite, you know, what's happening in the economy. It doesn't have that, but it does have that strong growth potential. So it's something that, you know, depending on your risk profile, you know, speak to your wealth advisor, find out this for you. So, so clearly, if, you know, to give a broader example, if you're someone that, you know, you need a dividend check and you need that profit to be there in order to, you know, help out with the expenses, then maybe you want to not participate in this one. But if you're someone that, you know, you're young, you're looking for something fresh, you know, a potential good investment, then you can talk to your wealth advisor and see if maybe this fit your, you know, your 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 risk profile. Right. Yeah. I like that you you said who this might be for. Did you lose yeah. some weight, Leo, or is it the beard? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Maybe it's a combination. <laughs> you had the beard. I haven't seen it in a minute. You had the beard yeah, before. Been, yeah, I had it before. Or you're it out it, more. Yeah, I think it's a little fuller in this in this state. But yeah, I had it before. <laughs> I make your face look slim, man. Oh. <laughs> Keisha, welcome yeah. back. Hey, uh, so, so I, I think the, the nugget in this company is the platform. And as we think mm -hmm. about the world going more into course creation, I think Eddie Focal is in a very unique point. I actually remember being at that um, launch with Kingston Beta 10 years ago, I actually was there and I heard um, Gordon pitching the company. And at the time I thought, yeah, this is a very good idea, taking education in an online format. It was, it was very revolutionary. And to see it 10 years later going to IPO is, is it's very inspiring. And the, the nugget here, Gordon said it, it's the platform. It's not what they're doing currently, but the future of that platform. And what he's beginning to do with his team is open that platform now, making it open architecture, which is a way forward because now he potentially can have companies putting their content on the platform. So the key is how many users can he bring to that platform, the sustainability of the platform, the, this, the I guess now the viability in terms of cyber threats and people hacking to get the information. But the strength of the platform is what will really propel the company forward. And I think that that is really where the value is in this type of company. Okay. All right. Let's look at some results now. So, David, you are looking at, well, it's not necessarily results, but PBS, Productive Business Solutions. They're looking to accelerate their growth momentum this year after having their best year ever in 2021. First of all, what does PBS do? So PBS has two specific divisions. They have a technology division and they have their, you know, I believe it's their specifically printing of paper. I can't remember the specific term right now, but even though Xerox printers are always here in the place, they are distributed for Xerox. Uh, Claro in the region, distributed for Claro. But those persons who had a CIBC ATM card, when you turn the back of it, it said Product Mini Solutions Limited. So they are a technology company basically. But they are mainly are along with, as I would say, along the value chain, more so from the hardware perspective and alongside the software perspective as well. So it listed back in 27, August 2017 on the JSC, you know, listed on the US side of the market, and they actually did the most tightly held stock on the JSC. So it is actually less than probably 0.8% of the issued shares outside of the top 10 and directors. So the stock is very illiquid at the moment. And has been that way for most of its time since it's on the JSC. But last year, what happened was that they actually acquired PBS Technology Group Limited from you know most and Jamaica and the other Portland uh, Portland funds. And you know, PBS Technology Group Limited, which they acquired, is what has driven that significant growth in their numbers in the last quarter, as you can understand. So in the last quarter, they did 8.35 million US dollars worth of 
net profit actually better with the shareholders which is the single largest ever profitable quarter in the entire history which is what drove them to create get a profitability target of 6.07 million us dollars for the entire calendar year or 941.34 million gmd so for those who know what energy group is if you know massey you know what energy group is so for those who don't know massey, massey was in this in a reorganization of, a, of its business they decided to dispose of the technology subsidiaries and they sold it to you know the consortium of investors and then the course of investors so the in this turn sold it to uh pbs Better to business solutions limited listing company jsc so mass technologies limited they did 487.25 million in revenue in 2019 in 2019 the financial year which was about 71.65 million us dollars or you know around the uh, call it 90 or above billion gmd and then generated 86.15 million dollars tt in net profit which is 12.67 million us dollars in net profit so the thing is right now you know things some of the synergies in the group you know so that a jamaican subsidiary and a barbina subsidiary so you know it's a rationalization right there and what they're doing and they're going to do this year is that they're going to issue preference shares However, unlike the preference share they issued back in 2017, which is a, re a cumulative redeemable preference share, meaning that it expires or it's redeemable within the next two years, they're going to issue perpetual preference shares. So what does that mean? So if you know how capital general company is, their told us at the top and you have ordinary shareholders at the bottom. For instance, at the top, in this case, their told us have limited, have the lowest risk, but at the same time, they have the greatest uh, quote unquote priority in the capital structure. So the company is still wound up, the toll has already paid first. The ordinary shareholders, persons who buy and sell ordinary shares of the companies on the JSC, they basically, you know, at the bottom of the at the rung, they have the quote unquote highest risk or the highest return or highest opportunity to make a greater return. Preference shareholders fall just slightly above the ordinary shareholders. So the company winds up, the preference shareholders get paid first, then the ordinary shareholders. With the, prefer with the perpetual preference shares, there is no redemption date. So the shareholders get their dividend as needed each year. And PBS is splitting it between 5 million preference shares in JMD at the rate of 10%, and then the 5 million preference shares at 9% as the US dollar rate, the interest rate they're going to be using. So um, it's going to be available only to you know institutional investors. We're not sure what they're going to do it as yet, but we, the, when it did the issue back in 2017 they raised 25 billion dollars j so you have might see a little bit around that range or slightly more because the company really wants to you know take advantage of the reach that they have across the region so they're in across more than say 15 territories in the caribbean so they're in set, set belize uh costa rica honduras uh trinidad and tobago grenada all over the quote-unquote caribbean latin american region so that is really where PBS is right now. So they acquired them in September 2021. So we only see one quarter performance for them. But going forward, you're going to see the real numbers kick in and PBS really kick off a stronger growth projection. Mm, all right. Let's look at another company. Leah, you've been looking at Express Catering. That's one that we don't speak of very often. Their Q2 financial results are out. What are the highlights? Yeah, man. All right. So Express Catering, um, they put out um, numbers the other day. So their second quarter, that ends November. That ends November for them. So this is ended November 2021. Um, one. So, right. so if I, yeah, so if I can show my screen here for a second to show uh, the history of how it's been performing. So, all right. So if you look um, in the most recent numbers, revenue was up about two over 200%. You know, it's fairly good numbers. Um, profit still made a loss, but the loss was reduced from what you saw. So if it, yeah, so if you see this here, it's up big from um, November 2020. So investors, you know, you know, seeing this turnaround happening here in the numbers. But if you look on it versus before COVID now, so you're going back to November 2019, you can see it's down about 24% from that high water mark here. So that's about 3.2 million US or 3.3 sorry, million US. Um, and of course, then the number's not there. So again, less loss, you know, reduce the loss from what I had in um, 
November 2020, but it's still a lot lower than a profit of like 493,000 US that I usually do um, or before COVID, right? So, you know, improvement is moving in the right direction, but um, I just put this here, um, you know, before COVID to give perspective of where this company is coming from, um, you know, in the broader context of things. So if you look on the full year, you can see again, uh, you know, if you look on each one of the years, so their year ended May 2021, you can see, you know, they had a loss in May 2021, um, you know, you look back to 2020, you can see, you know, reduced profit, you go back a little bit more, but, you know, to, to, to FY 2019, you can see that there may 3.7 million US, and this was no, you know, no COVID in this number. So the, the May 2020 numbers, um, year and that had some COVID in it, which is the reason why, you know, fell off to 1.5. But if you look on a fewer, you know, what they can do, this is what you're seeing. Now, if you look on the company's most recent results and they're talking about the revamping that they've done and all of that, that will put them in a position stronger going forward. As in like, you know, when, when travel returns to normal and so, which is in like immediate term horizon. So that's, that's good for them. Um, so another thing that you're seeing on the horizon is the problem is that you're seeing a compression in the gross profit margin. So if you look on this recent financial year, I think they did about 58% in gross profit margin. If you look in this most recent quarter, and usually they, they do around 73% um, in a Q2 quarter. So that, of course, we know what's happening in general with prices increasing, you know, generally just having inflation all over the place. And I think you know, this whole Ukraine situation is going to probably make that worse in the near term. But that is creating some pressures for them. Um, so that's showing up in the numbers. Now, if you move on and just take a look at the trading activity at the stock, what you saw today was kind of weird in the market. The stock actually fell today, uh, about 19% in the market trading. Um, it's a kind of weird activity. Started the day low and kind of moved up throughout the day. So it traded at like 450 on a day. Um, and then it kind of moved up through the course of the day to trade at like five dollars and I think thirty three cents to close out the day on the last trade. Um, but I think overall, though the results are good, but in the market though, you, you, if you just look on the raw market reaction, it was fairly negative. The, you know, just seeing how the performance was by the end of the day. But um, again, I wouldn't re react overreact too much to it um, in terms of thinking that this is a negative market. Read. I'll give it a couple of days because sometimes you have some weird gyrations in the market. Uh, because you know you might have a large sell and the stock is you know not that liquid um so then you can have those like a wild um, fluctuations in the market which will fix over time you know correct and then if you look on the year to day performance of the stock um uh, it is actually down now seven percent for the year um and that's compared to the junior market which is up about 17 percent for the year um so you know it's not so hard so it was it was doing fairly well tracking with the market until today's decline uh, and you can see even overshoot the market um at one point earlier in the year and then fell off um and then if you look here now just to zoom out a bit and look on the overall market so this is the junior market heat map for the performance up again as i said about 17 percent for the year but you can see that's because of a strong january a strong but not a strong february and then of course starting march are positive and I mean, the January was particularly strong. You can see that if we go back to, to, to 2017 to see a similar kind of performance to what you see in January. So overall, you can see that there's a lot of strength in the junior market, not in the overall market, but in the junior market in particular. So yeah, so yeah, so I think that um, should give investors a, a, you know, something to, to throw on. There's a couple more earnings coming out now. I see um, VMill coming out with earnings. You know, you're going to see a lot of earnings because it's year end. For a lot of companies, December year and reports starting to, to, to flood in. So, you know, in the next couple of days, you're going to see a few more earnings and then market reacting to that. And then we'll see how it performs, um, you know, in the few markets. So, what type of investor should be considering Express Catering? Yeah, man. So, Express Catering, it, it would be up there in terms of the risk profile. Reason being is that even though the company's performance is turning around, if you look on the balance sheet structure, it has a lot of debt. Um, because of all of these losses that the company sustained, its equity value has gone down. It usually pays out a high dividend. Well, you know, before COVID, usually paid out a relatively high um, um, dividend payout ratio. So that, of course, would slow down the rate of growth of of the equity and you know on the balance sheet growth overall. So because of that, it does up the risk profile of the company. So again, this is one of those that I think you know you're investing in in this current state. 
it's going to be a little bit more elevated. I don't, I don't think it's, you know, you know, too, too, you know, kind of too risky per se, but it's not as, there's a lot more stable names on the market. So whether it be, you know, right. like, you know, the Sephras, the, the, you know, the Scotias, you know, the large cap stable names, this is not one of those. But I don't think it's as risky as some of the other names with, you know, like negative equity and all that. Mm. They're not there. So it's kind of like in between that, that range. So moderate. Yeah, moderate. it's a more moderate risk profile. Um, again, at the end of the day, you have to talk to your financial advisor to see if it fits you. But yeah, I'll put this one more in the moderate um, space. And our standard disclaimer, this is not intended as financial advice. This is for education purposes only. Please consult your licensed financial advisor for advice specific to you. Leo is a financial advisor, but he's not your financial advisor. Yeah. All right. Let's hear from Keisha. So this is a hot topic this week and more, more than a hot topic. It got real when I heard the story of the Jamaican students having to walk how many miles in the cold, cold snow. Like whoa like it, it got real when i heard their story so this is not just something happening in isolation all the way all with uh, somewhere else in the world russia ukraine keisha this has an impact on a lot of things including of course global markets so what have you been yeah. noticing on the markets in the past week since this invasion began yeah so it's been a challenging year in equities. It's been between new variants starting off the year with hopes for or expectations for higher inflation and higher interest rates on the international markets. We now have a war, though Russia is not referring to it officially as a war. We do have a lot of tension and uprising and increasing tension. That's been creating now what we have, gloom, before, there was a lot of panic in the market around higher interest rates and the higher inflation and what that would look like in terms of uh, potential for companies and their growth. Now we're having gloom because we have a lot of people dying. We have sanctions escalating by the day against Russia and the Russian government is not backing down. They're still progressing with invading Ukraine and trying to take over um, the government there. Because of that, what we find then is that oil prices have been soaring higher and higher. And the thinking is that with Russia now heavily involved then in conflict, American oil, WTI, is safer. And so investors have been buying up US oil. And so oil is now above $100 per barrel. That's at an all-time high. I can, share, I can share my screen to show the chart. Uh, investors of, on oil are benefiting, but it is, it's been, these are very volatile markets. Definitely. Are you seeing my screen? Let me make sure I have it up here. Ebbs and flows. So as we look at us oil and just looking at the chart of that, the blue line, we see here oil now is at about $108 us per barrel coming from last week when it was in the 90s. Steep upward line in a very short period of time because persons have been buying up US oil thinking, well, the supplies with Russia may be impacted because of what's going on with the war there. But on the flip side, when you look at equities, when we look at the Dow Jones, for example, as the main barometer of equities in the US, we see completely opposite, right? Um, prices there for a lot of the, the US companies have been falling because persons have been dumping stocks and going into what you call safe haven type of investments. So we see a lot of people buying up gold, money is going to oil, money is going into bonds, and, and that's hurting you now the financial stocks on the US, right? Even in Jamaica, we see FESCO going higher and higher, and the thinking probably is that, well, you know, right. FESCO's tied see, to A lot prices. of people were... A lot yes. of people are, are commenting on that in the chat. So somebody said Fesco stock is soaring because the panel is yeah. comment on it. Fesco booming. And then Stocks Unedited said Fesco buy out the war money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Fesco has been a beneficiary indirectly because investors are thinking, well, you know, let me find some oil-related company in Jamaica. And so 
the, the stock has been doing well because of that. But highly volatile markets, of course, there's always opportunities to make money in these types of, types of markets. It's just more challenging. But we have oil doing well. We have gold doing well. But on the flip side, a lot of these tech companies that everyone knows and loves, those are under a lot of pressure, right? When we look at companies like Microsoft, for example, Dawn, Apple under pressure as well, Dawn. So you're getting a lot of uh, hits there as a shareholder. But on the flip side, there are profits on oil, there are profits on gold. And right now, people are buying bonds as well as investments. So volatile markets. Trade, yeah. but right, to so something a little bit safer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, flight to, to safety definitely happening for sure. Yeah, David. Uh, Khalil, yeah. I was just going to add that, to be honest, it's just the reality of, you know, Russia's impact in terms of what it's applied to the world, which is why everybody is so concerned because, for context, Russia is the third largest oil exporter in the world. They've been quote, I don't think they've been cut, cut out safety as yet. They're trying to, but, you know, Visa and, and Mascara have cut their services, same for Apple and whatever. So what's basically happening now as an issue is that because you have this issue in terms of getting oil from Russia, I you know that's one less supply in the market, you're going to have that same growing demand, which is ushering demand, so the same demand ushering supply, and with less supply in the market now, because as I said, Russia is number three as a supplier. If number three is out of the market, you're going to have trouble because for context, WTI or West Texas Intermediate, which is the pricing we use for oil here in Jamaica, that was actually over the high of $105 today. Note, this is not Brent crude, as you mentioned in your market recap right. earlier. This is WTI. WTI was at 105 Yes. Yeah. Postmark. No, it's at 108 Yeah. Oh, God. $108? Thank you, thanks, thanks, for that, <laughs> thanks for that note. Thanks for that note. Thanks for that note. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, wow. Yeah. Because Brent so, is the more expensive of the benchmarks. Yes. Yeah, WTI is crawling up. The, so in Russia, we haven't touched oil as yet. And a lot of the sanctions, no country has yet come out to say, yes, let's attack the oil reserves. However, investors are speculating and then buying up WTI reserves. And that's what's pushing up the price. Because let me give you some context, Kalila. So oil prices have technically gone up about 50% year to date. And yes. we just started March. Key note, we just started March which means two months into the year, and you see where oil is basically reached. And, you know, this is where you're seeing, the, as persons, you know, them, those other stocks on the market, US, Jamaica, wherever, you see the move towards those other oil selected companies. So, for example, New Purchase Energy Limited, which supplies LNG, their stock price has increased by, what, I think it's uh, in the last three days by 50%. In the last three days, because on the day when Russia invaded Ukraine, LNG prices into at 50%. Then mm. I got a stock called BPT and I got some options on it as well. And it was like, what, $6 about two weeks ago? And it's actually at $13, going $15 now. And nice. here in Jamaica, yeah. the reason why prices have this reason about PESCO, and PESCO is supposed to be a beneficiary of the current oil issue is because, for one, our economy is reopening. Every time I open Twitter, every person is talking about traffic. And persons are saying, hey, remember, after the holidays next week, this week, kids are going to be back at school next week. So you're going to have more persons on the road and in turn burning more fuel. That's one thing. Two, Pesco is a is a, is a, oil, is a gas retailer. So what they do, they buy the gas from Petrojam and they sell it to their dealers. And on top of that, they have their own gas station. No, but that's the reality. So the thing is, it's about Petrojam increases the price by, Pesco just, just passes it on to the dealer in turn. And the thing is, you cannot avoid using gas. Because if you're going to car with somebody, that person is going to be like, hey, we are contributing to the gas bill or something. So the thing is, even if it's because volumes don't move materially, it's because of where oil prices are going, along with Petrojam's own price increases, the revenue can technically increase by 50% in the same period compared to last year, even if their volumes are moved by a significant margin. And that's just because of what's going on right now. So mm -hmm. it's going to really impact us very shortly because we prices at like all time highs, well, seven year highs, coal has gone up at new, new highs, oil is where it is right now. I know it's going to try to increase costs of manufacturing companies and everybody else is going to just increase costs on the consumer. 
Because even first I went to the market, you know, I said, hey, I, I should, because my bill was like 30 grand, let's say my time is in November, it's $43,000 now. So this quote unquote war and the sanction of Russia is literally hurting us. So I don't think they're quote unquote sanction oil as yet because they mean they do that. They haven't touched it. Yeah. I mean, they do that clearly now. It's not going to end well because you have Alice and Wall Street in there in oil to go to $125. They're so one of the largest oil producers in the world. Number three. Yeah. yeah. The largest. Number three. Yeah, but we, we haven't touched the oil, but to not be too much gloom because it, it may seem, you know, a little bit very depressing as an investor, but there has, there's been no direct move on Russian oil production. Jesus, right so if now. Oil, all right, so hold on. If oil goes to $200 a barrel, right? Because it's like 100 yeah. now, and gas prices locally now are about $200 a liter. So $200 a barrel means that gas price is going to be $400 a liter. <laughs> actually, actually, potentially even there higher because, because here's a context to add to that, Kalila. Our oil energy import bill in 2019 was 1.63 billion US dollars, right? And that's when WTI prices were $55, right? Prices are going to be kind of red again. We're burning more energy costs, prices are seen at home as well. And oil prices are $100. And the thing is, even if oil is about $200, and you're quoting Nick in that analogy of, you know, prices are going to $400, you have to remember, higher oil prices means more US dollars are going to be spent to purchase or mm -hmm. purchase it, which in turn means greater depreciation in Jamaican dollar, which creates an even bit more vicious cycle of inflation. Because what we didn't get to mention, or I didn't remember seeing it in your market recap, was FSC and BOJ suspending US other instruments by discreted dealers and registrants for the next six months. So a broker cannot necessarily issue a US dollar bond, for example, or you know, issue US dollar margin loans. They can't do that. And you know, that's just a BOJ saying, hey, we really are seeing some very serious headwinds in the coming months because the NRA was on $500 million between December and January. And we haven't heard February's figure as yet. So we are going to see some serious headwinds this year. I said it from last year, it's going to be a very expensive 2022, but Russia basically just, you know, up to the ante. So well, higher oil prices, you know, it's going to really hurt, you know, or oh Pakistan boy. in the direction of gas prices, but it's going to ask more question than Jamaican dollar relative to the US dollar itself. Well, let me, let me offer a ray of hope. A ray of hope. Please, so the US, has, <laughs> the US has emergency supplies of oil and so um president biden has said yes they're tapping into those emergency reserves so that's now adding supply to the market to temper this move in oil prices so i don't see us going up to 200 that quickly because these emergency supply of oil reserves are being released slowly into the market so we, yeah. we will see higher prices yes but the pace of increase won't be that drastic yeah and the next thing to bear in mind you know, is that as the price moves moves higher it reduces demand. So as you can understand, you know, as the price, especially if it moves quickly, what's going to happen is that persons are going to find ways to cut back. So you're going to yeah, have Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to pull out my bicycle for sure. <laughs> yes, right? If you're going to talk so more. So, yeah, so there's, there's a there's a automatic kind of gauge that's in the system, like yes. something to kind of regulate it. So it's, uh, uh, while, of course, you're seeing the spike now, and I think a lot of the spike is speculation and uncertainty and all of that, um, the actual demand side of it just probably won't be there. Meaning that whether it be, you know, whether it be even demand coming out of China or other world powers will just slow down because, you know, the, the prices are too high. So, I mean, I wouldn't get too crazy with the numbers yet, but as it is now, though, yes, there's going to be some pain. The next thing to bear in mind, too, you know, is that that supply, um, as, as, as Keisha pointed out, as in, they haven't sanctioned on the gas and the oil yet coming out of Russia. No. If Russia cuts that off, it's a massive hit to their numbers. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think about 30% um, of their plus, of their um, the country's revenues comes from um, those um, oil and gas um, um, exports. So if they're supposed to cut off, it'd be basically cutting off and those spite the field. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. So because of that, it's likely that that supply will flow. So it's more the speculation of what's going to happen than the actual supply of the, the the commodities that's driving a lot of action. So um, I mean, again, nobody really knows the future, but I wouldn't venture too far in terms of forecasting where this thing might hit. Yeah, know, that's a good stuff. point because I bet you, if if gas prices got to four hundred dollars a liter, everybody who was 
hotting up and dying up to go back to work at the office, all of a sudden you're, you're gonna work from home again. <laughs> No, but Kalila, remember, like I'm, gonna, thing I'm is, working from home. Kalila, I'm not here's a joke, though. Kingston, I'm, I'm not commuting to Kingston anymore from Mandeville. Mm-hmm. Nope. No, here's it's a joke, though, Kalila. Here's a, a joke. Work from home situation. Here, here's another joke, though. Remember, higher oil prices mean higher light bill. So you can earn it from the spending the fuel when you're traveling by a vehicle. No AC. Fun only. <laughs> Matter of fact, <laughs> this is going to be it. It's oh, there's an interesting Kalina. instrument created man, from this. <laughs> I'm going to buy my options and I'm going to laugh because boy, there's Kalina. another um, investing instrument created from all of this. Ukrainian war bonds. That's new. <laughs> oh. Those were created. So Ukraine has issued war bonds. So they're raising money to help them fight against Russia. So the war bonds um, were issued earlier this week. The principal is 277 million US. It's been actively subscribed to. People are buying a lot of the bonds. Coupon rate is, um, the yield, sorry, is 11% in US dollar wow. terms, which is very wow. attractive. Uh, yes. Very high. They also had a GoFundMe account where they're raising cryptocurrencies to help um, fight in the war. And so far, they've raised 17 million in cryptocurrency. So I lots of new story. types are creative. Yeah. So people want to buy Ukrainian war bonds. How do you do that? How do you even do that, um, Keisha? <laughs> uh, so you, they'd be listed and you purchase them. They'd have a ticker. You, you buy the bonds. No, the, the, the thing or with bonds is repayment of principal, right? Making sure that you get back the money that you put in. The yield is very attractive, eleven percent. But yes, no, but showing you the options out there, showing you the options out there, guys. Well, there's that's always that's a way to make money. money. But that's the thing. Yeah. That's why it's eleven percent. Eleven percent for people who are aggressive with their risk, ready to take some risk. Yes. <laughs> but Kalila, because remember, where interest rates are in the US, we have to wrap it up, low. guys. We're way over time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. One, one final We're thing. Way over time. I was going to say last that. Last word, that David. Quick. All right. So I have a friend who actually was buying. The WTI barrel by WTI prices of, of oil to his first platform, and you know, he's up big time. And if you were a person who was buying options on the WTI call options on, on, the, on the barrels of oil, you could have turned call it $200 to $1,200 within call it less than a week just because of what Russia did. So, trust me, people are making money off of what all of this craziness because fiscal is almost 100% year to date. So, while there's pain, while there's fear, there is still a way to make money. And check your advisor. There's JMB, there's proven. Let's get this money. <laughs> Let's get this money. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. This was a great discussion. And to our viewers, don't forget to like the video. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube, please. Like the video and stay tuned. I have a final word for you just before we go. I saw some comments about the Edgefocal IPO. I have something to say about that before we go. This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers. All right. So before we go, Lori said, what's the dividend on the bonds? You're referring to the war bonds that Keisha just spoke about. She said uh, the interest rate is it's not dividends that bonds pay. They pay interest and it's 11%. The yield is what they call it. It would be about 11%. O'Shea says taking stock. Hot tonight? Yes, it was. Thank you, O'Shea. So the comment that I wanted to make was about edgefocal. So I saw a lot of people saying that they applied for uh, small amounts. And nothing's wrong with, with having a small amount of ownership in a company. I always say start with whatever you have. If you have a small amount of money, I mean, hey, that's what you have. Start with it, right? But bear in mind that when you have a small offering like an edgefocal, you are likely not going to get everything that you applied for. It is going to be very likely oversubscribed. And when an offering is, when an offering is oversubscribed, you're not going to get everything that you applied for. And when you look at offerings of this size, you are looking at maybe you get 10% or maybe even less. So... If your intention is to have 5,000 units in Edgefocal, which is $5,000 because it's a, thousand, uh, sorry, a dollar each, 
if you want to have 5,000 units, then you need to apply for 50,000 because you might get 10%. There's a good chance that you're not going to get the entire amount that you applied for. So if you applied for 5,000 and the allotments come out and you get 10%, then you're only getting $500 worth. You understand? If you applied for 100,000, you're only getting $10,000 worth. And these are examples because I don't know what the allotment will be when the numbers are announced. It all depends on how many people apply based on the number of shares that are available. So if you have, uh, and I'm just going to use some easy figures here to work with, let's say Edgefocal was selling 100 shares and 1,000 people apply for these 100 shares, they don't have 1,000 shares to sell. But because all of these people applied even before the open date, they have to be treated equally, right? So what they're going to do is break it up and give everybody a small piece of what they applied for. And that's how it works with oversubscription. So just bear that in mind. When you're applying for these small offers that are likely to be oversubscribed, you need to apply for a lot more than what you actually want. If you are able to, if you have the means, like if you... Because if you don't have it, you don't have it, right? You just apply for what you have and what you're, what you're able to afford. But that's just a note of caution and something that you should be considering when you are making your purchases. Well, that's it for our show for this evening. Stocks Unedited says 5% on your edge of focal uh, allotment. Oshane says the same thing, probably 5% for real. So I was just using 10 because it's easy to calculate, but it, it may well be closer to, to 5%. So just bear that in mind. Thank you so much for joining me yet another week. It was my pleasure hosting you. Oh, I should have been in Miami right now, but I'm here with you and I'm not mad at it. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Wherever in the world I am, I'm always going to be here with you on a Tuesday night. So until next time, I'm Khalila Reynolds. Say it with me. Let's get this Money. Bye bye. Let's get this money. <laughs>